Hi, I'm Wes Princefield. And I'm Foggy. And, and we, we approve of this man. Do we approve of the message too? Well, I hope so. I spent thousands of dollars. Okay, it's your call. You hear us come and go, but we know. You wonder if we're not alone, we're alone. You think about us all the time, don't. Because it doesn't matter why we're known, we're just known. Now, Bo, don't do nothing rash! Is this Kavanaugh's car? Yeah, but Bo, no! That's my car. Hey! Hey! Peter hey! says that Cavie's the guy for UCLA now, but he's got my balls in his car, and I want him back. Thank you, I know the pastor. You screwed me, Kavanaugh. Peter made me. Get your stuff out of the women's gym now. American Handball Associates present On digital file from Union City, California At the Crown Plaza Hotel The Handball Heroes Dinner This year a tribute to Mike Cavanaugh. Featuring an array of American handball stars. Los Dos Joes from Seattle. 84 and 88 Olympians, Joe Story and Joe McVeigh. The Marx Brothers from the original Cal Heat teams. National champions Mark Schindler, Mark Raggetts, and Mark Lockenmeyer. Cal Heat founder Jack Holloman. Along with original Cal Heat star, 84 and 88 Olympian, and perhaps the GOAT of American handball, Steve Goss. UCLA club team members and national champions Brian Marbach, Doug Thomas, and Wayne Johnson. Representing the U.S. Team Handball Foundation, 84 and 88 Olympian Rod Oshida. Special guest speaker, 84 Olympian and IOC member Mike Leonard. The first Cavi Award winner, Ray Gerke and his family. And your hosts, 1979 Nationals MVP, and national team player Wes Brinsfield and national team circle runner before he learned to pivot Mark Wright now let's look at how the day started with a banner ceremony during the California Cup America's premier handball club team tournament so as I was saying, we're about to commemorate two Gentlemen who have made handball possible in the Bay Area. The first is let's have a huge ovation for the man who made much handball possible, and we're going to be hanging his banner here in our. 
And again, the moment of silence is not something he wants. He wants something like this. So let's have a toast to the king. I came to the United States because, you know, I told my, one of my Hungarian friends, who, poor guy who died, he said, why you, why you want to do the farm? Because first of all, I didn't want to go to Australia, you know, Canada, because far away from communism. I said, you guys, you are stupid. Let's go, where is the dollar? <laughs> so I'm still looking for the dollar. So that's the reason I came to America. It's like a church music, church music, that is the reason, like Jesus Christ. Yeah, I remember. I still remember that. It was a ceremony. It was great. And, you know, walking over there with the brothers, you know, and the sisters from the American team, it was a great experience and great reminder. But these Europeans, they were practicing two times a day. We practice, you know, once a month maybe. And that is not practice enough. You know, so you cannot be, you know, that God, great player without practice. You know, you have to practice. How can I get to the... Carnegie Hall, practice, practice, practice. Ellie was started and they were leading by two or three goals and after we came back and we beat them by two goals, 22, 20, I never forget, two goals, that was a great. And they were, you know, those days, number 10 in the world. That was pretty good, it was pretty good. So we were very happy, or I was very happy, not myself only, but for the whole team. Play, the guys playing, you know, very, very good, yeah. You are free over here, you know, that is a wonderful thing. And, you know, thanks God, no, even I get a, 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 a how should I say, it's a, like a, a, for a poor people who they are, you know, like myself, you know, who cannot uh, see, they are bringing food for me, you know, five times a day, uh, five times a, a week, you know, so that is, that is good, you know. So I, pay, I have to pay only $32, so which is not that bad. My teammates, my teammates, good people, you know, mentally, physically, spiritually, they are very good people. And, you know, they were invite me to these parties, they, everything, we're not supposed to parties, but we did parties a couple of times. And the guys, they did, they did, we like each other, I think, so we love each other, yeah. Yeah, that is a good memory, that is a good memory. Never forget, never forget, two Olympics, one World Cup, you know. Shandor, my friend, we're gonna miss you, the whole handball family. I met Shandor back in 1969 when I was part of the Army Champs program, actually the first uh, U.S. player to, to participate in the Army Champs program. Went to Adelphi University and walked into the gym where uh, Shani was playing the goal. Lazlo was in there as well. And uh, we became longtime friends, friends forever, 50 years ago. Shandor, the handball family, we'll miss you. The king lives forever. Thank you, Tigers. Thank you. Tigers. Uh, yes, the United States Team Handball Foundation, for those who don't know, was uh, put together after the 84 Olympics by Peter Gibby. You know, what's turned out to be just a brilliant move by Peter. He started the, uh, he took the extra million dollars we got from Peter Ubroth uh, and put it in a separate entity. So it didn't go into the Federation operating budget, it went into, into a separate foundation, which is very, uh, very forward thinking by Peter. So we've got about, about, about seven, eight hundred thousand dollars And what we do is we pass along the interest to that to those that make requests. Um, I think somebody was uh, sent up here for this tournament. I know the Blue Cup is, uh, has, has certain funds as well. Uh, referee clinics, and as I think Mike Cavanaugh will tell you, you know, for the last probably 10 years now, um, we've been fortunate enough to really carry the Federation and sponsored the men's national team, the women's national team, the beach uh, national teams. And this was really a result of Peter separating those funds 
And there are five of us that sit on the board. Uh, Rick Hurst, Cindy Steiner, Mark Noble, Tom Fitzgerald, and myself. So it's not just me, it's all five. And all five of us are doing everything and everything we can to try to you know, keep this thing going. So when Mark made the request, who can say no? <laughs> so with that, I just want to shout out one last thing because this is for uh, what will probably turn into a bit of a roast uh, on Mr. Kavanaugh. Because he was, he is the reason I'm here. And it's been 37 years now since I went to that sports festival tryout in 1982. Um, I played the first festival uh, as a member of the Junior National Water Polo team. So I saw Team Manball. So when Mike sent the uh, request to the basketball coach at UC Irvine to get a couple of his players, the basketball players came up to me and said, hey, should we do this? I was like, are you kidding me? Half the girl, half the athletes here are women? <laughs> and all the fun we had the last time, so we went. But Mike failed to explain any of the rules. It was just take the ball and go. And so since I didn't know the rules, Anytime I had the ball, I shot it. And he thought that was real aggressive of me. <laughs> to the point where he put me on the team, and that was into that. So Mike, I think we can get you to cry again, because to be the world, to me, and for what you've done for me, and thank you very much. I really can't emphasize enough the importance of the foundation that is there for us uh, to take up little things like this and even more formidable competitions. Uh, and it's great to have Rod and Rick and Tom and everybody involved with that. Um, before we get to the award that we're going to be honoring Ray with, I'd like to bring up the 84 Olympian member of the IOC, the USOC, any OC that you can think of. <laughs> and my former roommate on Monday nights. <laughs> Let's hear it from Mike Leonard. Thanks, Mark. So Mark gave me a call, or a text. I'm down in Sao Paulo working, and he said, I need to make certain we have a good speech for Mike. Sorry, Ray, I know you'll be taken care of soon. Um, and he goes, I know you'll do it, and you'll be serious. And I'm, okay, I'm a little busy, and so on the flight back, I jotted down a few ideas. So. Mike Cavanaugh has led a rich and full sports life. As an athlete, you know he played on the national team in the World Championships in 1994, and he's played in national champions, championships for a record number of years. Although it's best we not dwell on how well he played in those, certainly in the last 40 years, he did in fact play in all those. Mike has served an important you said it was a bit of a roast, right? <laughs> what am I, not laughing? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Mike has served in leadership in important roles in the U.S. Team Handball Federation, the International Handball Federation, and the U.S. Olympic Committee. But most of all, he was, and still is, a handball coach. At the club level, he coached UCLA's handball team and its progeny, the West Coast All-Stars and the L.A. Stars. At the regional select level, he coached the West in the National Sports Festival and the U.S. Olympic Festival and USA West in international competitions in Vancouver and against the Japanese national team. And at an international level, he coached the U.S. national team. It's been my uh, honor, uh, pri privilege, well, it's been my experience to have been coached by Mike Cavanaugh at all three of those levels. Mike's special and unique coaching skills are best brought to light by a few stories. 
<laughs> Mike is a master manipul uh, motivator. <laughs> His file card technique, where he sits you, the team down before a big game and gives everyone a file card with the things they must do to ensure success, it has never been seen or done before and frankly was never done again after we made so much fun of him. He also is constantly worried about his athletes, going so far as to ensuring that they don't ingest the wrong kinds of things before games that might affect their performance. Of course, what he didn't understand is for those particular players, it enhanced their performance, but hey, we didn't get drug tested. And his emotional speeches to the team, usually starting with, at least when I played for UCLA along with Bob Djokovic, We've never beaten these guys in 12 minutes of how great it would be to beat this team. And then he makes the mistake of asking me and Djokovic to add anything to that. And of course we say, excuse my language, we've never fucking lost to these guys. It's not happening today. And Mike just kind of looks at us. Oh, good, good. <laughs> Mike is a player's coach. He deeply cares about his players. He's been known to stand watch over drunk national team athletes who are in an alley in Romania after having too much fun. Photographic what photo picture is there? There are photos of this. <laughs> and making certain that that athlete, also known as Park Wright, actually <laughs> will make it back to the hotel. This is caring for your players. He I'm also, no longer that person, so. <laughs> he also strove to learn from his players. Mike was schooled one night in, in uh, Denmark by Tim Funk in some very interesting science about the devastating effect of applying pressure to a tube filled with liquid. He picked up the, the, the knowledge immediately and immediately was, was thankful that Tim taught him that very important science project. <laughs> When necessary, oh, that's an inside joke. When, when necessary, Mike was a fair disciplinarian as a coach. When the national team went to a Halloween party, dressed as the women's volleyball team, it was one of our few nights out after months of hard work. And when five players missed curfew, Mike grounded them like they were eight years old or something. <laughs> and he kind of misjudged the situation because this created the political phenomenon known as Free the Oslo Five, Oslo <laughs> being the name of the dorm we lived in, and literally chants to this day can be heard at the Olympic Training Center of Free the Oslo Five. When, when Mike was coaching a, the West team, two of his players thought practice was about six to seven hours later than it actually was, and unfortunately they were out celebrating a birthday party with some athletes from another sport. They, they came to practice a little inebriated. They did not know that they had practiced at that time. And Mike, always the fair disciplinarian, invented the idea that he would take those two players, make them play with the second team, and teach them a lesson. But this kind of backfired on Mike as well because the second team beat the first team and Mike was seen muttering in the corner, oh my God, whatever I do, these guys are still too good. <laughs> Mike was an innovator. When we would have 6 a.m. fartlek, I don't know, seven, he decided that he had a way to inspire athletes and to reward those who were in the fastest group, the rabbits. And he made grown men put cotton balls taped to their butt <laughs> as they ran around the track. Alas, this backfired a bit on Mike as well, because this led to some jostling with the last group, also known as the goalkeepers. And Wes was a rabbit. Minus one. <laughs> uh, Wes was a rabbit. It led to this jostling, which eventually turned into full hatred between one of our players and one of the goalkeepers. But there was, a, there was a, a good moment to this. There was a silver lining. Mike got to show that he was the, the best at team building. So he called a team meeting. He talked to the team committee. No kids here, right? Okay. Uh, <laughs> talked to the team committee. 
he said, we need to have a meeting so that this player who keeps throwing the ball as hard as he can at the goalkeeper's head every chance he gets will be able to work it out with the goalkeeper. Mike went first, explaining how important the team was and we were all a family. He then asked the goalkeeper, so how do you feel that this other player throws the ball in your head every single time? He said, well, okay, I, I jostled the rabbits and I was giving them a hard time and I was pulling their cotton tails off, but I don't think it justifies throwing the ball at my head every time because I could get hurt. Mike was very happy. We're having an open discussion. The whole team's there. We're listening. He says to the player, so why do you throw the ball at the goalkeeper's head? And he said, I don't know. I just don't like the fucking guy. <laughs> <laughs> at that point, one of the members of the team come in. He stood up, clapped his hands, and said, good meeting, Mike. We're done. <laughs> but again, you know, it's, it's these efforts that had been Mike special. He was a role model. Mike was a role model. We watched intently as young athletes when Mike did this thing. I mean, we think he invented where he he would ask someone to kiss them, kiss him on the cheek. And then, well, actually, I'm not going to do that one because it was pretty inappropriate then. And I actually think this is illegal now. So I don't need to get Mike in, in trouble on that. But how could Mike not commit? Remember, this is being recorded. I know, that's why I said. How could Mike not command, as our coach, immediate respect, wearing his OP corduroy short shorts, his flip flops, and those hairy little legs on his skateboard scooting around in practice? This was a coach. On reflection, I'm not sure this technique of telling stories to illustrate Mike's special and unique coaching skills has really worked. So maybe I'll shift gears and we'll do a kind of a spin on It's a Wonderful Life with Mike as George Bailey. Mike's coaching affected his players deeply. Club and regional teams coached by Mike have won many medals. Many athletes coached by Mike on his club and regional teams went on to great accomplishments in handball. Almost 20 players Mike coached at club and regional levels went on, later went on to the national team. Half a dozen of athletes Mike coached at club and regional levels later went on to the Olympians. One of the athletes Mike coached, again, at club and regional levels later went on to be an international referee and actually refereed in the Olympic Games. Four of the athletes Mike coached later went on to be named U.S. Athletes, U.S. Handball Athletes of the Year. Mike's personal successes and his achievements are amplified by the effect he has had on his players and their achievements. Without Mike's coaching, no matter how brief, these athletes never would have gone on to achieve these things. Or, well, well, maybe it was in spite of Mike's coaching. <laughs> or maybe his coaching hardened us so that we were, well, anyway, whatever the effect his coaching had on those players, for many here, Mike was our coach. He was our teammate. He is our friend. We love him and are so pleased to be able to honor him tonight. Thank you. Michael Leonard, ladies and gentlemen. And just because there was sort of a ribald nature to that, Mike Cavanaugh, I just want to remind you of two words. Frankie Tuck. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. <laughs> Where that came from? <laughs> <laughs> we all remember, don't touch my tuts. <laughs> You're not going to So, without further ado, I'm going to bring up our man of honor who will hopefully make some remarks, and then we're going to give out the first Cavi Award. 
to our first recipient. So without further ado, I give you Mike Kavanaugh. apparently is from the Air Force. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. What'd you expect? What'd you expect? I'm overwhelmed. I'm humble. So, so appreciative of every person in this room. <clears throat> really, I, I didn't prepare any remarks. This is off the top of my head. And I can go around the room and look at each of you and say to my team, I don't want to lie. You know, it's a, it's a particular challenge when you uh, coach coach your friends, your same period. And sometimes I go back in my room and I just think, how do I do this? <clears throat> so the Oslo Five was just, that it just happened. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it, I'm going to show these guys. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, uh, the whole thing about throwing the goals off at the top of UCLA's gyms just because they didn't want to carry them down the steps. <laughs> <laughs> that was drug induced. And <laughs> um, so, serendipity, and I know that's a big word for me. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna randomly just say that uh, my life has been certain to be, but it's been a blessed certain to be, um, in that not a lot of you knew that I played junior college football for Chicago City College, ranked ninth in the nation. <coughs> uh, it, was, it was a tough load. I made the traveling squad by, by holding for extra points and field goals. <laughs> and, uh, the ninth came, uh, safety, starting safety broke his ankle, and so I heard my name and I went out there and I had the big gag. I was one of two white guys on the defensive team, and the, uh, the captain said, oh, fine, because I'm gagging, about ready to start, start to play a game. I said, I'm fine. Anyway, that experience led to me dropping a calculus course. Here's where the serendipity comes in. 18 months later, I'm drafted. Oh shit, I'm in a lot of trouble here. Oh, I'll do my job. Um, went in the Army uh, and uh, did reasonably well. Thought I would test well. I did test well. I said, uh, we can give you West Point. Uh, what's that? I kind of knew because there was a TV program. <laughs> well, it's uh, all engineering. Four years, got to drop the two years of college, I did, and uh, uh, five year commitment after that, so doing the numbers. And he said, and by the way, it's all engineering. And I said, oh shit, there's calculus again. <laughs> <laughs> what else you got? <laughs> Kept kicking the can down the road, and uh, serendipity, I ended up uh, with orders to Vietnam. My specialty was a machine gunner, and uh, life expectancy wasn't good at that time. And got orders for Vietnam. The next day, they pulled eight of us out of 200. Talk about serendipity. And the captain said, you got the old guard. What's the old guard? So you got White House duty. And he said, thank you, God. Okay, I get there, and I'm playing on the post football team, the company football team. His quarterback was from Troy State through Dimes, and we won the uh, won the battalion championships. Um, word came down at that time because of the interviewing, having lunch with General Westmoreland. Say, so give me 24 guys, and I'll make Olympians out. 
kind of imagine this is a time in the Vietnam War where there's a lot of guys, a lot of D1 athletes in, in the Army. So, <clears throat> so the, the order the command came down to send two of your best athletes from every 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 fort to Fort Dix. Well, my buddy was the quarterback. I wasn't the best athlete on the team, and in, 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 in the uh, in the fort, they sent me and another guy. We went to Fort Dix. They were all on the bus. You know, guys going to Fort Dix. Uh, I'm, I'll make this up that brief because I see, uh, see some heads nodding. <laughs> in agreement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so I said, what are we going to do? We're going to go for Dix and we're going to learn this new game. Okay, what's the game? Well, the ball's about the size of a Volkswagen. <laughs> Forty guys on each guy, each side push it up and down. What is it? Oh my God, what is this there? I got there, Dennis Burkholz was active duty army, but he had the longest hair, and I said, that guy's my hero. And they were, they were picking for the national team, and I was left-handed, and I had some speed, and uh, one thing led to another. So, that was serendipity getting into handball. And it came to, okay, do I move to New Jersey and live with 14 guys on welfare to try and make the 72 team? And quite honestly, I promised my family I'd go back to school, and so uh, you know, it just didn't seem a fit. So other guys have, have done it, but I, I couldn't handle it. Went back to UCLA. <clears throat> they changed the requirement for kinesiology to not have calculus. <laughs> <laughs> so, and so I, I got my BS and MS, and I was very, very fortunate. I met some wonderful people, and along the way, recruited a lot of you to come play this game. <sighs> this has never been told. I saw in the Daily Bruin that they had a handball team. Oh, good they? So I went up, I remember just opening up the gym upstairs in Beano Barn, is what it's called, and looking, and there were all these guys in the daily room, it was all Swiss team and all German team, and I said, these guys are really good. And put up the door. Holy shit, who are these guys? You know? Now, people think that I started handball at UCLA, and I didn't. Uh, Bo Svensson, who was an actor, was the guy. And he was there teaching some acting skills, and he's done some things, Walking Tall Part Two and Frankenstein, and you know, that, and that kind of thing. Um, so I went into my street clothes. I just had tennis shoes on. He said, "Yeah, come play." So I started playing. I was, you know, one of the better guys there. And Bo Svensson picked up the booklet, picked up all the uniforms. He said, "You're the new president." First night. <laughs> and so then we we started there. And I, Brian, I don't know where you came from. Uh, Wes, I don't know where you came from. <laughs> Wayne, Mark, somebody recruit, recruited you in Bruin Walk um, and coalesced and, and, and made some things. Uh, I have a sense I'm boring people, but I'm spilling my guts here. And just saying that it was wonderful, and then I got a phone call from Jack Coleman at Cal State Hayward. And, and I don't know if you came down or if we came up. It was the first encounter. You came but down. You came down. Uh, and then seeing Joe McBain and Jumpin' Joe and Steve Goskin and the rest, the rest is history, it was just magical. Mark, uh, Mark, some guys who were, you know, dear to my heart, except for the Cal State Human guy that knocked me out. I was a right, a right jab or a left jab, and all of a sudden I'm looking up at the ceiling. <laughs> And Brian looked at me and he said, oh, <laughs> <laughs> that was exposed. <laughs> and then I turned to Mike Leonard in my almost semi-consciousness and I said, are you going to do anything? <laughs> he was a referee. And he said, yeah, I kicked him out of the game, but he left the gym. You know? like, uh. So, um, but then spending the hours with Joe Story trying to produce a urine sample and kind of what you're in the country. <laughs> So, uh, so Ford, I, I, I was eighty four and four. Oh. No, 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 no. Oh, I, I was the world championships where we sat there with the uh, fans. I thought it was Joe. I thought you had a big bladder. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm not going to sleep. <laughs> Straighten out who's got the big bladder. <laughs> Just got his players. Okay. All right. Um, guys. It, it, been magical, and uh, we're extending up, which means my time. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I had to stretch my legs. <laughs>
but in, in all seriousness, I'd have to be you know, I am so, so fortunate to have had a position in credential for eight Olympic games. After I went to the first one, it was like, God, this is too good. Other opportunities, other opportunities. You know, who would imagine that I'd be the village coordinator for men's downhill skiing? I had no respect for winter athletes. What skis down? You go down the hill. What's the big deal? Driving up to Albertville, they said that's the downhill. Oh my God! You know, you make a mistake and you snap a finger. But I will tell you that the, the downhill skiers were far more effective with the female athletes than the football players ever. <laughs> Experiences, wonderful experiences, and uh, also have the deepest respect for each of you. And Mark, thanks so much for putting this together. And oh, it was you, was. you and Wes, and Ray, I'm glad you could be here with us and uh, sharing sharing the moments. And uh, I don't know how to end. your thank, thanks for being here. My home will always be your own. <laughs> it often has been. <laughs> um, but you're not done yet. Thank you. <laughs>by the Centerville Middle School Gymnasium to open it up for play, something he's been doing on Monday and Wednesday nights for almost 20 years. This gym is special though. It just happens to house the only permanent, full-size, fully marked team handball court in America. And the guy with the keys just happens to be the person for whom the court is named. This is Ray Gerke, the man who made the Centerville Team Handball Club the talk of the sport inside the house that Ray built. I, I insisted uh, when they marked the courts, we have a, a full team, uh, basketball court marked in black, and I made sure when they were lining the court for Team Handball, that the goalies area would be marked red so you could see it right away. And we have the out of bounds marked red so it uh, has the court marked out. And then we have our logo of uh, our Mustang uh, Team Handball logo in the middle of the court. So uh, I'm, I'm very, very proud uh, to have this facility. Ray had been a coach and teacher at Centerville Middle School for several years when in 1979 he and another teacher began an intramural program in team handball, a sport he had discovered while doing research for a graduate degree. Things built up from there. My colleague, who was department head at the time, um, said let's try it. 
and he tried it in the eighth grade and I tried it in the seventh grade and then we didn't have goals so we used high jump standards as goals and they had to throw it past uh, under the height of the of the goalie and we tried it that way uh, we used rules from uh, a book on uh, rules of the games and it has the rules of all the sports and we played it real funky the the first couple of years because we really didn't know what we were doing a friendship with Cal Heat coach Jack Holloman, playing in nearby Hayward, led to a trip to Colorado Springs in 1983 to watch the national championships. With a first-hand look at what real handball was like, Ray was hooked. So I traveled with the Cal Heat. I took my video camera uh, and went around and videoed it, things to show uh, my classes, and really fell in love with the game because uh, it's soccer with your hands and uh, a lot of scoring and everybody gets to score and uh, at, the, at the youth level even the goalie score sometimes. With this background in the sport and with Cal Heat players eager to teach the game to the kids, Ray began his program at Centerville. It grew a little bigger each year. We started a league, uh, first of all co-ed, uh, about eight teams, uh, about 10 on a team, so we had about 80. And then uh, so we decided to have a seventh grade league, an eighth grade league for the boys, and then combine the girls. So we had three, three leagues. One of the reporters came down and did a nice article on Team Handball, and I contacted him, and he started putting in junior high intramural scores in the paper each week. So we had our own little articles in the paper for an intramural program uh, and this lasted uh, about six or seven years through the program. We had uh, a regular thing. Then we actually had some uh, banquets for the kids, uh, gave trophies out to the best players. Uh, Mark Wright was our first guest speaker uh, and we had about uh, 40 students and their families and Mark Wright and uh, some dignitaries from the school district. In the late 80s, the team had developed so well and was so anxious for competition, it traveled to Winnipeg for a junior tournament. In uh, 1990, 91, and 92, we went to Winnipeg, Canada. Um, I got an invitation uh, from the director up there, and uh, they have a sports festival during the winter and it's the, the f festival of the, the Voyager. And we went up, uh, I, first of all, before we could go up there, I, I asked the principal and he looked at me kind of strange and he said, you know, I'm gonna let you go, but you gotta take me with you. Half the players on the team that hadn't even been out of the state. I had five players, we took 12 players. I had five players that had never been on an airplane before. Uh, the school at Winnipeg, Canada that hosted us, they did a great job because we stayed with uh, families there. Uh, the kids had to, we had to uh, raise money for um, our, our flights. Uh, we sold a lot of nachos at lunchtime and a lot of fundraisers. Then a most amazing thing happened. The school's principal, Garo Marigian, who had accompanied the team on several of their trips, caught Ray's enthusiasm for the sport. He envisioned a place where handball would always flourish for young kids. And so when the opportunity arose to build a new school gymnasium, he made sure the dimensions were big enough for a real court, with real handball boundaries, including circles with red interiors, just like you might find in France or Denmark. The principal talked up with the school district to, because of uh, team handball and what it's done with the kids and he saw he saw he 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 could really he was a great thinker he, he saw what it did for the kids and how many kids we had in the program he wanted to keep it going and at the time the Cal Heat was practicing across the bay uh, and he wanted to bring the adults in to help help the kids and help the program grow so he pushed for a full team handball court marked in the gym 
Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to Fremont, California, the site of a special uh, team handball competition uh, today. With the construction of the gym, the Centerville Middle School Team Handball Club reached the zenith of its influence in the sport. To commemorate the opening, a game was staged and recorded between two of the top club teams in the world, Team Deacon, the Finnish club team champion, and the Sushi Masters, a, le a legendary American club team, the reigning national champion with a roster of seven past Olympians. We had an international game uh, with the Sushi Masters, uh, United States uh, defending uh, national champions, and uh, a team from Finland, Team Dickin Club from Finland, and uh, they played. Uh, it was on a cable TV station. We had announcers, we had uh, cameras, uh, uh, bo uh, booms, everything, and it was just a great experience. These days, Ray is much more likely to be found watching his son Jeff, a former Centerville handball player turned tennis professional. Ray has been retired for a few years now, and without him, the program is not nearly as robust as it was. Still, he shows up every Monday and Wednesday to make the gym the only real handball court in America, available to both young kids and the adults from the Cal Heat club team. It's a program he's eager to sustain, and he hangs around to make sure things are run correctly. After all, when your name's on the court, you got to make it look good. Ray, it's my honor. My understanding is that you went on a sabbatical to Europe, looked at handball, and said, we can do this back here. And then you came back to Centerville, and you made a few phone calls, and put a few things together. And it's been a remarkable program, which has also reached a lot of people. And I'm going to give the microphone to you. You got the first cap. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Do you have an official oh, camera? <laughs> it's an apple. It has to be official. <laughs> and then landscape. Not a portrait. <laughs> Now from behind the speaker. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. 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 That was aimed at my swatch. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. And thank you, Mark. I really didn't start handball that way. What actually happened was um, my colleague at Centerville Junior High saw two minutes of the 72 Olympics on TV. That's all they showed then. And uh, down the road, we were adding something to our PE program. And in 1979, we added Team Handball. Well, we didn't know anything about it. We went to an encyclopedia sport and looked at the rules. And the first couple of years we played handball, if you looked at it, you guys would really laugh. It wasn't really handball. And we started with uh, high jump standards as the goals. And they had to throw it under the goalie's height to score. Well, one team got real smart, and they stuck a midget in the goal <laughs> so they couldn't score. We got a little smarter the next year. We drilled a hole in the ground next to a, a basketball standard, and we put a pole in, got an old soccer net, tied a rope to the two and had goals. The kids have a lot of fun. They kept coming back and uh, we played a, a little tournament at noon and they wanted to keep playing. And I was crazy enough to keep doing this with them. And all of a sudden we had uh, 200 kids playing and we had uh, two blacktop courts and three grass courts. And on uh, Tuesday, the seventh graders played and on Wednesday, the eighth graders played, and on Thursday, uh, the girls played. And our local paper, uh, I actually uh, knew one of the reporters, and he was putting our junior high intramural sports scores in the paper with pictures. So we got good publicity. 
And then I finally called uh, Mike to see how to really play it. And uh, he said, there's somebody right down the street from you, uh, Jack Holloman. So I found out when Jack was gonna have a game, and this was actually the first real handball game I ever saw. And I went up to Jack afterwards and I said, uh, why well, didn't even, I didn't know who Jack was. So I picked one of the tall players and he says, he's that little short guy over there. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, I told Jack that I would like to talk to him later and learn more about handball. And he shook my hand and I looked at my hand and uh, I thought Big Bird just crapped him. <laughs> that was my first experience with stick. <laughs> but Jack and Mikel Heat uh, helped us with clinics and coaching, refereeing, and uh, our program grew. Uh, we got to competitive teams, and what we did was uh, we were the only team in the area except uh, Sunnyvale Junior High. So we played some practice matches with them. And then the kids, we want to play other schools. So I had a great principal, and he let us go at lunchtime to do demonstrations at junior highs, high schools, or whatever, and to get it in their program. And we eventually had about a 10 team uh, tournament uh, seventh graders, eighth graders, and girls, and we had a, a good thing going. And uh, our competitive team won uh, six Western Regional tournaments. Then they didn't have uh, junior national championships, but we won it on the West Coast. And uh, I got a call from uh, Winnipeg, Canada, and they wanted us to come up to a tournament up there. So I went to my principal, and he was great, Carl Morrigan, and he's one of the main reasons we have the gym. Uh, he's, I said, is it possible to go there? And he said, well, the only way you're going to go there is you take me with <laughs> He went with us three years in a row. We won uh, two championships up there. We got good press, uh, which helped a handball in our area. And then we had some international tournaments here with teams from Winnipeg coming down to uh, Fremont. And I tried to get uh, the city involved. So one of the international tournaments, I had the mayor come out, and he threw out the first ball like baseball. I don't know if that ever happened in the handball, uh, but we had the mayor involved and we got some uh, proclamations and uh, nice press and paper uh, from there. And uh, I actually won, I don't know, I, had to, I did it, but I won teacher of the year for all my, my handball doing uh, over science teachers and math teachers and that uh, for our school district. So all this notor notoriety, uh, I greatly owe Jack and Mike and a lot of a lot of you that helped out refereeing and uh, coaching my kids, uh, and that's how we got the gym. When they were going to build a gym, and the principal, uh, top sport at our school was handball. We had uh, 200 or 300 kids playing at lunchtime intramurals, and all this notoriety uh, helped handball. And when we built the gym, the principal pushed for a full team handball court. And without him, we probably wouldn't have the court, but we have a full Olympic sized team handball court. And I was department head and head of sports then. So I made sure that we have our red uh, penalty areas and uh, red around the border. And it's a handball court, not a basketball court. And uh, Cal Heat has been using it and helping us all these years. Now I retired from coaching in that. Uh, I said, we still have handball at the school. I started an intramural program. We have 16 sports. I have eight people helping me coach, and handball is one of the sports, so it's still there. And my kids are feeding into uh, Cal Heath's junior, junior kids. But again, I couldn't do it without a lot of you people in the room, and I appreciate this award. And uh, I think even though we're all retired, but uh, we can still do things for handball. And in your area, uh, help with starting uh, programs and clinics and things for handball. And uh, I hope we all continue to do that so this work grows. Thank you.
getting all retired. We have a team play tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> we actually had to call in extra ambulances for <laughs> to be here. Um, I saw you guys warming up uh, in between games, and I wondered if I should call 911. <laughs> 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 Okay, um, so this is about Ray, and in addition to everything you just heard, you may not know that Ray is actually, uh, through his efforts to get a full-size gym, has been uh, one of the first activists for environmental awareness. And the reason I say that is because prior to having a full-time gym, a full-size gym, or any gym that was marked, we had to take every gym. And did you know that it takes, now you can fact check me on this if you wish, about six and a half rolls of tape to tape a full-size court. It's about 215 meters of tape. And over the course of the existence of that gym, and let's say it started in 1995-96, I estimate there are about 1,750 practices that would have been held there that we would have had to have taped, or whoever was playing there. That works out to, and a couple tournaments, so about 1,820 linings of tape, or 11,886.96896 rolls of tape that is not in a landfill right now. <laughs> so thank you very much. By the way, at, a, at about $10 a roll, that's a roughly $120,000 you saved handball. <laughs> in addition to uh, the time, it takes about one person hour for Lenny, and if you give him just some you know, meager wages to do that. That's another about uh, you know, thirty-six, thirty-seven thousand dollars. So roughly two hundred and twenty thousand dollars if you save handball and everybody for doing this, and in addition to the roles that would have otherwise been in the uh, the landfill. So thank you very much for doing that. <laughs> um, I would also now that I'm up here um, now switching kind of back to Mike. But first off, not forgetting that Ray started all this, and the reason that we actually were able to do a lot of the playing and we did is because we had a court to play on. And uh, and so thank you. But now for Mike, Mike, this is sent in by Bruce, um, one of my partners in crime. And by the way, in all fairness to the goals, we actually thought they might bounce. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, just like NASA, I had done my calculations in meters instead of yards. <laughs> I made a mistake, sorry. Uh, so this is uh, from, uh, and I'm, I'm reading, so I, I apologize for looking down and also squinting. Uh, I had, uh, I first met Mike as he was standing behind a table under a handball goal on Bruin Walk. He was recruiting for the UCLA Handball Club. I told him I knew all about handball as I had spent the last year in Germany as an exchange student and that I thought it was a crazy game and you couldn't pay me to play it. <laughs> His sparkling personality and can-do attitude about the sport made me think again and give it a try. It was one of the best decisions I've ever made. I know, thanks to that, to, I know that to Mike, the initials THC has and always will mean Team Handball Club. At the time, however, those initials meant something much different <laughs> to, <laughs> to some players. <laughs> um, uh, I know Mike was perhaps frustrated and less than happy with my attitude about how to approach a game. Yet even though I knew he did not approve of my approach, I have to respect his tolerance for me and his totally professional way of dealing with the many situations he was less than happy about, about me when I was preparing. The fact that we experienced much success is a tribute to all of our preparation under our leader and coach, Mike. I look back very fondly on my experiences in handball Handball has been very, very good to me. I know all of y'all because of Team Handball. Mike Cavanaugh was a big part of that. Have a great time and celebrate like that. I was thinking of doing a speech and telling the story about Cavi when he was coaching us in preparation for the 1980 Pan Am qualifier. I was impressed with his attention to detail and the amount of structure he had in our practices. Prior to one of our games, I saw that he had a blank envelope on his clipboard, and when I inquired about it, he told me that he had adopted the practice from one of his members at UCLA, one of his mentors at UCLA, Coach John Wood. He said that Coach Wood would write down his predicted score of the game and place it in a sealed envelope. I think he said that Coach Wooden wouldn't share the results with anyone and that it was just for his own edification. 
I don't think I ever knew of Mike sharing his predictions, but I saw the blank envelope many times. Um, I was planning to leverage the blank envelope into a Johnny Carson, the great Carmack uh, outline, a routine, and hold the envelope to my head and state the name, Mike Cavanaugh. Opening the envelope, the letter would read, who is the man who started the West Coast team handball movement, who represented America in the international handball arena for over 40 years, and the one man who, as a player, a coach, and a promoter, has perse persevered to make handball in America a game of note. So, that's Mike Cavanaugh. There you go, that's from Tom. <laughs> So, in addition to everything else, I give you now Mark Lockenmeyer. A cow he declared from years gone by. So, Mike, you've, you've kind of taught and worked with so many generations of team handball players. And I was maybe the third wave of your team handball players. And I started in 1990, I went to the refing clinic, I never knew how to play the game, you taught me how to ref before I could play the game. After that, I met up with Goss and Don Lawson, we won the national championship my first year. And uh, you had confidence enough in me to make me the Olympic team, or Olympic festival coach three times, and then the competition manager for the 1996 Olympics, which was a great experience. And I was able to share that with my son Ben, who was a ball player. So the Cal Heat and myself that put together this plaque for you that symbolizes generations of team handball players, coaches, officials, volunteers that you have affected and had an influence on. I wanted you to come up here and accept this. The award shows sort of the old guard at our reunion a couple years, last year. One of our women's teams that won a medal. When we won, we won the gold medal, and you're there giving out the gold medal with. Uh... Yep. And then our team that won the national championship last year. Mike, this is all your influence to all those generations of players. So thank you. All right, I'm going to read what we put on the plaque. Mike Cavanaugh, in humble appreciation for your unrivaled contribution to U.S. team handball throughout four decades and your generous relationship with the Cal Heat. Fremont, California, January 25, 2020. Really hard. 
hard for me to get to know and, and to get to appreciate. But your years on the foundation, nothing to do with athletics. Um, and only recently have you come very dear to my heart. What you do and have been under will continue to be. Better late than ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just some guys, it's just, okay, it's too slow. Mike, you, you always treat me like an asshole. <laughs> 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 on the court. And I, I hated this when you'd say, see ya. And you'd do a swim move and go by. And <laughs> you did it with such vengeance. And, and, um, but, you know, remarkable, remarkable achievements and career and that you still continue to. I'm going to lead somebody out. I uh, almost lost my life with Wayne Johnson. Um, and I honestly say that. Uh, as, as a diving partner, we were oblivious to conditions. and uh, I, It's too long to start it. <laughs> Wes took you to Hungary and you faced the best, the epic, iconic, Nine meter shooter and <laughs> just remember your hair. Hearing <laughs> me left and right and ball was in the goal. Um, See, I was good then. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't get me. <laughs> that was the <laughs> Jack. Jesus. You guys. Mark Wright, who uh, you're probably still getting the marijuana smell out of the curtains in my apartment. <laughs> 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 I have stories about I it. I sent three people over to <laughs> That's all right, Mark. It's legal now. Oh, <laughs> uh, jeez. Anyway. <laughs> Thank you for this. It's beautiful. Um, I'm, I'm humble. You guys want to see me cry, don't you? Yeah, you may. <laughs> I know you are. Come yeah. more. We're counting. <laughs> The over under is six. <laughs> <laughs> we have a crying committee. What's the number we at? Nine. 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 But we had to hear from you. Are those tears? <laughs> yes! <laughs> uh, I had to leave the room because three beers is a lot for me. And, uh, uh, make your call. Anyway, I want to look each of you in the eye and tell you that I love you. And you're very deep in my heart, much as repaired as it is. Um, <laughs> I identify. <laughs> yeah. I can relate to that. Uh, and you got, you, you, you flew in here. You gave up your, your wives and your family, and, and I, I'm, I'm so touched, so blessed. How can I finish this? Cry. I'm on 10. I'm on 10. Please, everybody's on 10. I need one more. <laughs> you got it. Learned that I apparently gave up my wife for uh, <laughs> <the life. Yeah. laughs> So that's going to be a tough phone call. <laughs> I, I, I'm in Fremont and I think I've fallen in love <laughs> with someone, but it ain't you. Anyway, I can't tell you how much we, when I say we, American Handball Associates, <laughs> or something like it, will be doing this annually uh, if Wes and I have any uh, say in it to uh, promote the California Cup because it's the best team handball tournament in the country other than nationals. And we want to Make sure that next year, Jack Holliman's name is hanging. And maybe Joe and Steve and we'll keep doing this. But uh, from AHA, uh -huh. uh, you got to love that acronym. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we appreciate everybody coming out. And uh, I, I dropped the microphone again. Uh, <laughs> So, as I understand, the bartender is going to be kept around, and tequila is, well, 
is blowing and so give yourself a round of applause. Hey Mike, hope you're having a great evening. Wish I was there. Mark called me and told me about it and uh, just by coincidence my family is actually taking me to my favorite barbecue place for my birthday uh, tonight. And uh, actually my 65th birthday which sounds awful. But hope you guys are having a great evening. Hope the banquet's great. Glad you're getting some recognition that you fully deserve. And uh, for people that don't have any idea who I am, Mike and I met at my very first camp, which was at West Point, probably 1974. I think I was 19 years old. And Mike kind of showed me the ropes, kept me from getting lost or wandering off while we were traveling into all the big cities and stuff. So, Mike, thank you for all you did. For me I have nothing but the best memories of all those times and if you ever get in the southeast please do me a big favor and give me a call don't wait be like Mark and not call me till you get back to Los Angeles so have a great evening wish I was there good luck thanks a lot Bye. greetings from MP in New York I wish I could be there as you celebrate these three legends and team handball congrats Ray Gerke on having all your history with the sport recognized with your friends and your family. Mike Cavanaugh, you've been the heart and soul of that sport ever since I was introduced to it back in 1978. Congrats to you on the inaugural Cavi Award, much deserved. And of course, wonderful memories of Shandor the King. Salute to everybody. Mike Cavanaugh, my longtime friend since 1971. Mike and I met at Fort Lee, Virginia, I believe. It's part of the Army Champs program. Michael, you've done a great job being a head of handball for 30, 35, 40 years that you are in charge of the program. What we all want to do when we leave a job, an opportunity, is to make certain that we we helped a lot of people on our journey. We mentored one or two or three or four. You've certainly done that with the Air Force handball team and with all the friends that you've helped become Olympians along the way. For that, I'm sure that the whole handball family uh, is appreciative of you and your efforts. I know that I am and I'm appreciative of being your friend for the last 50 years. Good luck to you.